Good, uh, good morning. That was a fabulous talk, Iman. Um, really inspirational. Thank you. You gave me some good, <clears throat> some good ideas. We, um, just a little bit about the FD Center, is, is we're all about working with entrepreneurs and, and helping people really, as Iman was saying, look at themselves first. Look at the resources within, because that's where all the dreams and hopes and good stuff resides, not at all, all the macro stuff out there and all the politics and, and stuff we hear, the rhetoric. So um, some really good messages for those entrepreneurs in the room and those that, that um, are dreaming the dreams. Um, our country needs you guys to go out there and create and, uh, and do your thing. Today though, um, we're gonna be talking about finance <clears throat> the thing that most entrepreneurs and most businesses need to stay alive. Finance and cash flow is the, the biggest growth um, driver in business when you have access to finance. When you don't have that finance, it, it can be the biggest inhibitor to growth. Um, and so we we'd thought that we'd like to put this panel together and, and thanks to Darren uh, of Adams and Adams for inviting us to be here just to talk a little bit about finance and finance in its different forms because we're all aware of the banks, the, the, the four major banks out there. Um, however, the banks are limited and restricted in terms of the finance mandates they have in terms of what they can lend and who they can lend it to and the security requirements they need or the collateral they need. And you all know that. <clears throat> so we're not gonna put any of the four banks on the stage today. It's all about alternative funding as we call it some kinds of, of different debt funding that some of you are aware of and some of you may not be aware of. And then also we're talking a little bit about equity funding and that is more around shareholder funding and equity funding for, for businesses. So if I could invite the panel members to please join me on the stage and then I will um, ask each of you to, to just introduce yourself. So Zara, KP, Andrew, Darren and Paul, um, or Chris, sorry. Right, thanks for joining. So in a moment, I'm gonna introduce and just ask everyone to talk for about two minutes about what you do and who you are. Just give a little bit of background. And then I'll come back to sharing a bit more about, about what we're gonna talk about this morning. So if I can start with the funding hub and just, if you just wanna introduce yourself, Chris, and, and just let us know a little bit about you. Perfect, thanks very much, um, Ryan. I just want to touch on something that Iman said earlier, and that's about the SME sector and what it does for employment levels in South Africa. The other important thing that SMEs do and young businesses do is they grow faster. And businesses that grow faster are able to employ more people. And the only way that we're going to get over this employment status is if the economy grows, and the best way to do that is through small business. So I'm Chris Ball from Funding Hub. Um, our kind of founder is somewhere out in the crowd, Marilyn might be back there. Um, what Funding Hub is, it's an aggregator or comparison website for different financing options. So we've got 36 different finance, alternative financing businesses on our platform. So an individual or business can come onto our platform and apply for business, for business finance. And from there, our algorithms sort them to try to source them the best type of finance that's possible. So one of the issues that young businesses have at the moment is applying for the wrong type of finance for their cash flow scenario and their type of business. You have you know, restaurants that are applying for heavy assets type of finance when something like merchant finance might be more appropriate for them. And what we try to do at Funding Hub is use our algorithms to cut down this time spent by these entrepreneurs and allocate them to the best lenders possible and hopefully also get them the best rates. Great, thanks Chris. I'm gonna move over to Zara. Hi Zara. Hi, hi Ryan. Uh, so my name is Zara. I'm a co-founder of a firm called Izenzele Holdings. And what we do is we facilitate access to finance. We understand the funding landscape, every, everything from the uh, contract finance institutions to the alternative financiers that are offering a range of, of finance. And, and a big portion of what we do is developmental grant funding. 
So as Iman mentioned, you know, she, she often hears people say, don't go to the DFIs, you're not going to get money, they're not going to give that to you. We understand how that works and, and our, one of our main roles is to help businesses actually access those funds that, uh, that government has to offer, both on a grant side as well as loans. So essentially what we do is help businesses understand what their fi funding requirements are, uh, from there, link them with the most appropriate funder and then take them through the process of actually successfully applying for those funds. Short and sweet. Thanks, Zara. Andrew? Uh, hi, thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm Andrew Mierberg. I'm the Regional Director of Corporate Finance from FD Centre. Um, I also didn't want to be a lawyer, in my <laughs> So uh, we, uh, I, I deal with the, the M&A side of the business, so I uh, help clients with sell-side, buy-side advisory services, also help with the funding, um, similar to, to, to Uzunzela in terms of uh, can scale right from the developmental funding side through to the commercial funding side, equity funding side as well. Uh, also focus on exit planning, often find that um, businesses spend a, a lot of time building their business, but they spend very little time thinking about what's going to happen one day when they sell their business and they allow events to happen and they sell under pressure and they don't get the good price. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. KP. I'm Kumaran Pediachi from uh, Spartan SME Finance and we are a funder. We are a alternative debt funder and what that means is that our funding supplements a traditional funder like a bank so we're not substituting them. The types of funding that we do is uh, growth finance, specialized asset finance and working capital and bridging finance. It's all debt um, and we deal not with startups, we deal with established growing SMEs. That's our, that's our target market. Great, thanks KP and Darren. Thanks. Uh, Thanks, Ryan. I'm Darren from Adams and Adams, uh, and my role here is uh, we see innovation every day. And as a lawyer, they come in, and especially if they versed in patents, they don't tell anyone. And many instances, that's the end game. And so many, much of this innovation just falls flat. And so about a year and a half ago, perhaps two years ago, I got uh, I was chatting at an event, and I met Hilton from the FD Center and invited me to become part of this forum. Really, you map the ecosystem around really leveraging the innovation. And it was an eye-opener for me. So the FD Center, you just said part-time FDs, it's much more than that. It's a community around an ecosystem that enables one to unlock innovation. And so, for me, that's excellent because it means that when they come and ask for a patent or a trademark, it doesn't become a grudge purchase. It becomes an understanding of value. It's not the end game, and that's why I, I, I'm enjoying this panel so much and your, and your centre. Thank you, thank you. And just a little bit more about the FD centre. You know, we're not a funding house per se. We're, we're a company that outsources CFO or finance director services to growing business and to some corporates. So we are the people that might facilitate or help you get the finance that you might need for your business, but we're not funders per se. Um, just to, just to set that, that record straight. So I'm going to move into some questions now, and these are typical questions that clients would have, would have asked um, our funders, so you can get some understanding about what, what typically happens out in the marketplace and, and some of the frustrations with getting funds or not. And then if there are any questions, if you could just type them into your, your app that, um, that you've got hopefully operating now, and then we can pick those up afterwards. So I'm going to start with, with Chris, and I've got a few questions set up for you, so if you don't mind. Yeah, shoot, eh? Um, so this concept of alternative funding, we talk about this, and what, what, how can you describe that? What does it actually mean? So I think alternative funding would be anything that the banks aren't doing at the moment. Um, and alternative funding started a while back um, as, a, as a funding alternative especially when the kind of latest laws of Basel were implemented in South Africa. And there was a gap for, you know, people that weren't, weren't achieving the lowest cost of capital, but were able to provide a different service in terms of specialist unique funding. So, you know, the, the, one of the more interesting one at the moment, types of funding at the moment is purchase order financing, where you've got a business that is speci specifically dedicated to financing purchases to facilitate trade between different businesses. 
<clears throat> and so why are alternative funders in business? I mean, surely they're competing against the banks and larger you know, finance institutions um, with deeper pockets and perhaps lower interest rates? So I think the, you know, the banks do have deeper pockets and generally do have lower interest rates. And you'll chat to alternative lenders and they're not competing on that level. They're competing in totally different things. They're competing in providing you a kind of turnkey financing solution. They're competing in terms of turnaround time. They're competing in terms of level of service. And also, I guess the other big one is access, market access. Most of the alternative lenders that we deal with nowadays are available through an app or th online. Um, the way that business is being done now, and you know, I think lots of you are to understand how busy your lives are. Lots of the entrepreneurs and CEOs' lives are equally as busy, if not busier. So their, their desire to not have to go sit in a branch network and to apply for finance online is one of the, one of the leading kind of trends at the moment. Right. Um, so the funding hub must see many applications for business funding. What are some of the major, major reasons why people don't get that funding? So I think the biggest reason why people don't get funding is just not being prepared. And there are lots of interesting businesses out there that are showing the kind of growth metrics that are required and showing the kind of scale that's required to receive funding. But the individual hasn't prepared themselves for the financing round. They haven't quite yet you know, got their, their accounting up to date or their bank statements up to date. Um, and they're just not, not quite ready to be in a position to take on that funding. And finally, in your experience, um, what appear to be the most popular products that are coming through the platform at the moment and why? So as indicated earlier, um, purchase order finance is probably our fastest growing kind of line item. Uh, it's, a, it's a line item that's it's kind of provided lots of opportunity to small entrepreneurs that are getting into the industry. Um, so something that's really revolutionary for, for small businesses and individuals trying to break into kind of corporate life. And then the other one that we kind of see growing quite quickly is also invoice discounting. Um, I think, you know, lots of these small businesses are ending up supplying pick and pays, Woolworths, and pick and pay and Woolworths are saying, well, cool, we'll pay you 160 days later. Um, and these guys have gone and created a product, manufactured it, and then distributed it, and then all of a sudden they're also being asked to, pay, to wait 160 days for payments. You, in that time, you've paid for resources, you've paid for staff, you've paid for things that you actually need. So, you know, I think it's, it's one, of the, one of the ones that's most needed and is also the fastest growing on the site. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris, for those insights. Really appreciate it. I'm going to move on now to Spartan because um, we'd like to hear from KP, and I'm going to ask you a few questions in a similar vein to, this, to, to what I asked Chris. But cool. KP um, you know, runs a business, Spartan SME Finance, and he's at the coalface looking at loans and looking at people's requirements. And so how and when should people best prepare or should an entrepreneur best prepare for funding? And are business plans an absolute requirement these days? Sure. So they should prepare early when you need the funding. But uh, the challenge that we see is that an SME, an entrepreneur, they're constantly battling with a lack of capacity and time and bandwidth. You know, we're getting applications through our uh, website and inquiries that are 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, the oddest of times, because you think about it, the person goes and you know finishes their, their day there at seven o'clock, gets home, has supper, starts at nine and starts going. So the thing is, it needs to be early, uh, but, they, but they don't have the time. And the how, I would say, is that to have the, the financial information ready, that's the most important thing. And uh, second is to figure out and anticipate what type of questions a funder would ask you, have your cash flow ready, and I would also advocate going to some kind of an advisor because this is a Greek translation type of thing dealing with funders. And so sometimes there are people that can translate or navigate or help you, advise you through the process. So that could be something. As far as business plans, I don't advocate uh, business plans for funding. I think a business plan is a very noble, important document that should be secret for yourself if done for the proper 
reason, which is to craft your thinking and ponder and pondulate all this type of stuff. But, but uh, if it's done for a funder, you're giving it to some kind of consultant, they're putting something in, the funder asks you questions, you're faffing around, you don't know what's going on, you come off second best. So, and it takes you a long time to do it for funding. Okay, thanks. So let's talk about collateral uh, security. Uh, when is it necessary, um, and if I do not have sufficient collateral, uh, will preparing a cash flow forecast help, or how does it work? So the principle of, uh, of collateral is there's certain transactions, there are not many, certain transactions that can stand on its own. You know, Chris mentioned uh, invoice discounting or purchase order financing. Those are things where you are leveraging on the counterparty. So the SME itself, how strong or weak they are is irrelevant. And so collateral becomes mostly irrelevant in that context. And so, so too is an invoice discounting. But on everything else, collateral becomes an, an issue because uh, a funder is not certain if you can pay, how you can pay, there's performance risk, there's delivery risk, all those kinds of things. And, and the collateral is something like, okay, when it all goes to shit, what happens? I need something to hold on to. Uh, and you find a traditional funder would, be, would go to collateral first. That's the starting point. And an alternative funder would likely go to collateral last. Ourselves, we look at it as the last thing. Uh, and, and a traditional funder will want these days two to three times cover. What that means is if you want a five million rand loan, they typically want 10 million rand of collateral cover. And you may think that's unreasonable, and so do we, but, but there's a valid reason for that, is that you've got this house, you know, if you look at the housing market, it's totally stuffed right now. So you've got this house for 10 million rand, if you're gonna put it on auction, you may not even, it may not even be sold. And if it's sold, it may sell for 50% of its value. There you go, that's why they, 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 they want that. But the other ways to make a funder comfortable is to offer them other forms of security, debtors book, session of share, all kinds of different things to show that, listen, you want to mitigate the risk. So this is, I, I, I would say there's a distinction between ability and willingness. If you just demonstrate the willingness, you can figure out the ability to do it. Thank you. Um, what are some of the key expectations in a funding scenario in terms of the client versus the funder? I would say there's a lot of frustration from the client side and it's understandable. So from the client side, they would want the funder to just get me. I want them to understand me. And then the funder, I would want them to also just get us and understand us. So it's about each party wants the other to understand each other very well. That's a normal expectation. I would say in funding, it's even heightened. And so this, this requirement for empathy, not sympathy, but empathy on both sides is important starting point. The second is that expectations for a funder is to is for the client to be ready with all the information. And, and that, you'd be surprised, is probably the biggest reason why most people don't get funding. The info is not ready. It's a stupid reason to fail or get delayed, but that's what it is. The other thing a, a funder's expectation would be is for the entrepreneur or the client to be upfront and candid. You think that they don't know if you're trying to wangle and weasel, and, but, but they would know. They have access for all kinds of data points, all kinds of information, just be upfront because the character aspect is an important fund, important part. I would say from the expect, another expectation, this time from the client side, is for the funder to be responsive, not dilly-dallying and taking a long time because there's an urgency. Remember I said earlier on they're applying, not in advance, but when it's too late. So they want a funder to be responsive. And I would say the other thing, which is a bit rare, they want a funder to be candid because often you don't hear the real reason why you're not getting the funding, why it's not working, and you can't take that failure and reiterate and figure it out and go to another funder. So, and, and it's emotional thing. So funders sometimes just want to, you know, if you're breaking up with someone, you just want to say, listen, it didn't work out, and you don't want to go into the real reasons because it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then finally, why, I suppose, and you've answered some of that, is in your experience, the, the common reasons for failing, you know, yes. for not, not being successful. The one thing, I'm going to iterate this song again, is about not having your financial stuff ready. So the funder says, I can't make a decision. And uh, so that's one. Two would be, uh, this is a big one, is uh, you, you, the funder is not comfortable that you can repay the loan. 
You see, if you're a private individual and you're borrowing for your car or your house, it's easier there because they look at a percentage of your salary and surplus to say, okay, they can afford that car installment of that, not that car, but this car, and likewise with the house. How does that work in a business? You look at the past track record, you may look at future contracts, earnings, and the cash flow. If a funder says, I can't see that you're going to pay me, that, so that's a big one. And so you should figure that out yourself first before asking. And the third one I would say would be, um, would be character issues. You know, the funder thinks you're dodgy. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So, Some uh, good so, insights. There. Sorry, Rona, I'd like to just jump in there. Um, KP and myself have been in negotiations with a client for the last two weeks, and hopefully I'm getting a term sheet today from you, and uh, I now understand yeah. all the frustration you've gone through with me and my client. <laughs> we'll talk on the balcony. I think we might push you over there. <laughs> so, first rule, don't be dodgy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, I'm going to move on to Zara and to Zara to just talk a little about Uzinzeli and grant funding. Um, so, right, what exactly is grant funding and what does it mean and should you expect to repay a grant? So, let me answer that last little bit there um, and the simple answer is no. Grant, cash grants are funds that are put into to a business, typically speaking and, and in the space we deal with from government. Um, institutions, and they are there to support the growth of the business. So they are that. You're being granted the money, you're not expected to repay it, unless you haven't achieved those things you said you're going to achieve. So grant funding is, is funding that is available for growth of specific uh, issues and sectors, primarily manufacturing industrial type sectors. What government is looking to achieve is the growth of the South African economy. And so a lot of people will say, but I've got this great property transaction, why won't government fund that? Or I have uh, a service business, why, why can't I get grant funding for that? And the reason is it doesn't have the same massive growth for the, for the RAND that they're putting into, into that sort of project. Um, manufacturing is something that government really likes to support. It creates jobs, it transfers skills. Uh, you're, you're really contributing to the economy. You're developing some sort of product that can be exported. So it has, it has massive impact. Um, over and above that, and where, where uh, a lot of businesses get it confused, is what will grant funds actually fund in that business? And they will primarily fund capital expenditure. So a lot of businesses want uh, grant funds for their working capital, to buy stock, to pay salaries, and grant funds are not available to do that, um, to, you know, by and large. So, so yeah, I think that pretty much answers Great. that question. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, you've mentioned a bit about sectors, but are there any other sectors you'd like to just mention so people know what is supported? I mean, I'll touch on, on one or two of the funds that are available. So, for example, there's a specific fund uh, at the DTI called the Agro Processing Support Scheme. Um, that is a fund that's, that focuses on supporting primarily agro processing uh, businesses. So, not primary agriculture, and primary agriculture tends to be something that is difficult to fund. Um, but the agro-processing element, so now again you're talking about production, you're talking about manufacturing, and that goes into to once again building the economy, supporting that growth, and there there's up to 20 million rand in grant funding available for your capital expenditure requirements. Of course, with every grant fund, there are criteria that have to be met. A, one of the, the myths, so to speak, of grant funding is that you have to have, have black ownership to access them. That's not true at all. In fact, there's only one grant that absolutely requires a majority black ownership, and that's the black industrialist scheme. Other than that, it, it relies on a, a uh, certain BE level, anywhere from four and above to, there are some that even uh, will accept applications that are level eight. So, so there's a lot of funding out there. There's also another fund, for example, there's the automotive incentive scheme. And that's to help businesses in the automotive value chain. And as we know, South Africa has now got this big new automotive plan to 2030 to, to build over a million vehicles a year. And that's significant. We're building just over 200,000 at the moment. Um, so, so there's a lot of support there uh, from government to help these businesses capacitate in order to supply that, uh, that sector. And then you mentioned that you don't have to be fully black owned, but can grant funding be used for black equity or black ownership? 
So grant funds aren't there to, to buy equity. Um, they're not at all available for the purchase of shares or businesses. What, what does happen and what we've, uh, what we've looked at doing is where there is a white-owned business that wants to transform, uh, it sees that there's value for it in transforming, in, in, uh, so the growth of its business will, of course, be impacted by, by improving its black ownership. And they're in the manufacturing space, for example. What often happens is they're looking to improve or upgrade their machinery uh, or perhaps diversify, bring in new new items into their, their manufacturing process and require machinery for that. So they need two things. They need growth on their capital expenditure side and they need transformation. That grant funding may perhaps only be available from, for example, the black industrialist scheme. And so what you can do is look at leveraging these two together. You bring on a black partner and by doing that, you also have the availability of accessing the black industrialist scheme. What we do always say, however, is you know, bring on a partner that can add value to the business. Your black partner should not just be there for the sake of saying, I've got, I've got this black partner and now I'm transformed. Bring in a partner, look at what you need in your business. Is it financial? Is it marketing? Um, is, it, is it technical? And find the right partner that's going to bring that capacity to the business. All right, thank you. And then finally, um, Grant, there's a myth that grant funding is difficult to access. So if you could just give us a case study, a short case study on a success of yours, and then just how long the process possibly could take, you know, for someone who's interested. Sure. So, look, grant funding isn't easy to access. Um, it's, it's got a lot of red tape, but it's about understanding. So first and foremost, and, you know, as has been mentioned on this panel already, understanding what you're applying for funding for is critical. So to apply to the right fund is step one. Read the guidelines. Uh, certainly goes a long way to ensuring that you're meeting the criteria. So if you meet the criteria and understanding those criteria, it makes the process a lot easier right away. Um, I, I think, let me, let me give a success story uh, of one of our clients. Um, we had a business that was already in business, established, 100% black owned, looking to now expand. They, they'd reached their production capacity. They were running 24 hours a day, six and a half days a week, couldn't manufacture another item. So I met them at, a, at an event and they were telling me they were gonna invest 15 million rand into a new machine. Uh, so I said to them, I said, well, have you heard of the black industrialist scheme? Uh, it has a minimum criteria of 30 million rand capital expenditure to qualify. So they were at 15 million rand already. What we've learned and what we've experienced is that a lot of businesses say to themselves, I need to buy a machine, I need 15 million rand funding because that's how much my machine costs. When that happens, they haven't considered what is the cost of the building improvements that are required, additional electricity you're going to need, uh, your uh, uh, increase in commercial vehicles, working capital, everything else that goes along with making that one machine work. By the time we'd sat down with them and engaged with them and unpacked their project, it was closer to the 70 million rand mark. And what happened was we then applied to the Black Industrialist Scheme for grant funding. And very, very nicely with them, they were a good business, a solid business, good track record, uh, good blue chip clients, the likes of Clix and Jet, et cetera. Um, and within three months, they had an approval from the Black Industrialist Scheme. You know, we put that together. And we applied for a lot of things that most businesses wouldn't even think of applying for um, and had that funded through the, the incentive as well. So they got a nice, uh, about 25 million rand in grant funding. They funded about 15 million rand themselves. They already had that, and the balance uh, was raised as debt. Okay. Thanks for that story. Um, right, Zara, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. I'm going to move on to Andrew from, from the FT Center and talk, talk a little bit now about equity finance, which is which the other, other side of, of the finance equation. Perhaps you could just share with us um, how does the FD Center and its team of finance directors or principals, as we call them, fit into the funding equation with clients and funders? Thank you, Ron. Um, I think you, uh, a funding decision is a very strategic decision. And one of the core skills or the things or the core services that FD Center offers to its clients is financial, st uh, strategic financial support. So it fits in very well. When you, and, and I've heard it coming from the other panel members as well, that um, uh, you, when, you, when you need to raise funding, you need to have a good narrative. And that narrative's got to be, why do I need the funding? How am I going to apply the funding? When I've applied the funding, what will it look like and will I be able to repay the, uh, repay the funder? 
So you need to have all of that prepared. The one thing that, that uh, the, somebody like KP doesn't want to have is somebody rocky up and saying, I need money, but you know, I, I don't know, I'm not sure if I can repay it or not. So, so the FT Center's principles are very good at taking the financial strategy, i.e. what are we going to do, and looking at the cash flows that, uh, that come from that financial strategy and the application of the capital, and then looking at whether it can be, uh, you can afford to repay it, putting it in a model, putting it in a very succinct way, uh, and coming up with a cash flow that you can actually use for, uh, for the funder. Um, I think uh, later on, you then get into the stage where the, the offers start coming back from the funders, and you need somebody to assess that and start negotiating it. And there's always questions coming back from the funders in terms of they don't understand something or you haven't explained something properly to them. So, so the FD Center's principles play a good role in, in that, uh, taking the funding language and turning it into the entrepreneurial language and acting as the, the gear between the two. Right, thanks. Um, and then, in your opinion, do the funders here cover the, or represent the full range of funding needs? Uh, so, so but you've got the bulk of the, the, the debt funders here, but um, funding isn't just uh, debt funding. There's a lot of other funding as well. Uh, equity funding, and, and I'll break the equity funding into two parts. That's the, the entrepreneur's skin in the game themselves, what they commit. As, and, uh, and, and then, uh, of course, there's other equity funding people, trade, trade players uh, or private equity firms who, if they see a good jockey, are willing to, to, to put equity funding behind that jockey as well. So, so the equity funding, that we haven't got up here today. You've also got a lot of, uh, and, and, and sorry, you just mentioned it, uh, Narcam, for example, a lot of ED and SD funding out there. So there's a lot of funding that's being put out by corporates under ED and SD to develop suppliers, and, and that funding is available as well. Narcam, the, the automotive industry, is, is putting 4 billion rand into a fund, uh, which is there to develop tier two suppliers into the automotive industry. And, and, and clearly, there's another source of funding that we haven't got those ED, SD people here today. Um, the, then, one of the things that's also very interesting as well is how, how you, how you, Find you, you must structure your, what you're asking for properly. So I often find I go out to somebody and they say, okay, right, I, I need 50 million, and this is the opposite to your experience, but I need 50 million uh, because I want to get this manufacturing thing going and I need to buy a building and I need to buy a bucky and I need to do this and I need to do that. And then you stop and you look at it and you say to the guy, why are you buying the building? If you don't buy the building, you only need 20 million rands worth of funding. People will rent to you. Um, uh, don't buy the software. There are software providers out there who will give you the funding and rent the software to you. So, you know, you're starting from a, from a, uh, a point of view where you've got a business that you want to make work. Don't try and get 100% and make it absolutely perfect. Just focus on that first little thing that you can do. Try and minimize the amount of funding that you need and, th and then go out and aim for that. So, uh, when you say that, the, the, that that is a type of funding, and that type of funding is avoiding a uh, certain expenditure that is not necessary to, to get that business up and going. Okay, right. And then just a little bit about, um, off topic a little bit, but I know you're involved in exit planning and exit structures. If you want to just share a little bit about that in terms of the funding of that uh, type of service. So I think, the, and again, the exit planning, I'd just like to make the point that people, the entrepreneurs, spend a lot of time, three o'clock in the morning, building their business, but they don't spend much time thinking about how they're going to exit it, and they are going to exit it one day, whether it's to children or sell it off to somebody else. And, and so there's a, a need for that to, to focus, or focus, getting your business ready for exit. And then there are lots of ways of, once you've got a good business, there's, there's lots of people out there who would like to buy it. Um, and, and then one of the things that I find quite interesting, and Zara, you just brought it up now, is you talking in terms of here's a, a, a business that needs to transform and they need to bring in a, a black jockey and the black jockey doesn't have the funds and the business who wants to transform doesn't want to give away their equity stake for nothing. And then you've got this free government funding that comes in. And if you... If you take that black jockey and put them together with untransformed business, the business is now transformed, you use the government grant funding to, uh, to build or double up the size of the business, and then the, 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 the guy that 
had the business in the, in the beginning. He has now got a business that's double the size, but he owns 50% of double the size, or hopefully three times the size. Uh, and now he's got somebody who's going to take that business over from him, and he can exit these last 50% and take that money and walk away from it. So, so funding around exit planning, you've got to be very innovative. You can, you can the, the owner can fund part of it, sell it. So they say that a business uh, where you actually sell the business and provide the funding to the buyer is likely to fetch a premium of 20 to 30% over a business where you just say, here it is, pay me the cash and I'm out of here. So there's a lot of innovative funding that you can do around exit planning in terms of funding it yourself, uh, bringing somebody in to run the business with you, doubling it up, using free grant funding, maybe selling it off, getting an ED fund to, to, to invest in your business so that you can transform it and there's somebody else in the supply chain that, that, uh, that is a, a transformed uh, supplier. Lots of different ways of doing it. Great, thanks Andrew. Thanks for, for explaining all that. Um, Darren, I'm going to move across to you. Now, Darren wants to just share a little bit with us about IP and how it can be used and abused perhaps for, <laughs> for capital raising or fundraising and then also the collateral implications around IP and, and how that all plays out. Darren, I'm just going to hand over to you for that. Super. First thing, if you've got a big red screen here saying time's up, it's not. Uh, I think <laughs> we've got some time. Um, and hopefully there's a couple of questions there that we're going to get to. If you'll just bear with me, just to illustrate my point, I'm just going to just go to some slides. Just uh, I'll, I'll go through them quite quickly, but I want to just put a veneer, an intellectual property veneer on this and how IP can actually assist in this funding conversation. Uh, so if Bongani at the back there wouldn't mind just putting on my slide, I'd appreciate that. While he's uh, doing that, um, the uh, I guess a question, has everyone, anyone heard of Elizabeth Holmes? Yeah, there we go, the lady up on the screen. Just by a quick show of hands. Fair enough. Okay. Well, let's just watch the next clip just to give you an understanding. Firstly, of how, um, firstly, it's a great example of KP's phrase, don't be dodgy. <laughs> but the second one is how an IP story can really create significant value. I mean, her trial is next year, 2020, in, in, in August, and, and everyone's going to be watching that. I mean, I haven't put it up there because of the the scandal around it, but what really intrigues me is how she can become a $10 billion company on the back of really a technology story. And an IP component is significant within that. So it shows the value of IP in generating interest, stakeholder interest for investment. And there are parallels with stories here in South Africa. There's an executive at the moment who's about to stand trial for irregularities around accounting practices relating in part related to IP. So. What's this all about? Let's have a quick look. Um, a favorite slide of mine, just to illustrate the relative value of intangibles relative to tangibles over a period of time. So 1975, let's say, your, your value in your company, and this is S&P data, is locked up in your, is in your tangible assets relative to 2009, and the same narrative for 2019, to be honest. Uh, the most significant part is your intangible assets. On the right-hand side of that screen, you're going to see uh, Prof King. Uh, and that's a photograph I took from the audience using a, the exact same slide to illustrate uh, governance around, um, around intangible assets. So intangible assets are a huge component of market value. Let's understand quickly, un unpack that just a little bit. Tangible assets, of course, machinery, buildings, capital assets, infrastructure, balance sheets, everything that these chaps have been and, and, and uh, Zara has been talking about. Uh, and then, of course, your intangible assets, part of that um, is your, your intellectual capital, for example. An intellectual property sits here is your legal right to those intangible assets. So, for example, a trademark is effectively your title deed to your brand. So, if you think of it in that way, you'll understand how IP fits into the, the conversation. So, flipping the bird just a little bit further, you're going to get your four uh, or five components of IP, trademarks, copyrights, know-how, and designs. Those are your basic elements. I'm not going to go into them in any depth, other than to say that internally generated IP is not disclosed on company balance sheets, significantly undervaluing companies or providing a very limited scope on potential value. So, uh, in, as an example, and KP's looking at me like I'm dodgy, but <laughs> basically what I'm saying, KP, can I get some money from you? And you'll say, well, what collateral have you got? I say, I've got a patent. And you'll say, I'm sorry, we can't find another funder. And uh, I think that's uh, fair. If I'm 
No, mostly yes. Mostly yes. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is, is quite common, because if you look at the Theranos example, I mean, uh, what's to say? That person had a lot of patents, and yet it was untested, untried technology. So what security is there for, for, for the funder? Um, but let's have a look again, let's go back into South Africa's dropout. I, I think it's particularly acute in South Africa. Let's have a look. Patent filings worldwide. It's a lovely graph, a lovely business to be in. Unless you're in South Africa. So, patents are a, a, an estimation of your, your potential value and your monopoly right over innovation. And look at our trend relative to the world. Trademark rights. Another great business to be in. In Africa, very much the same. In South Africa, it's not bad, but nowhere close to the angle of the worldwide graphs. So what we're saying there is that the investment in intellectual property that underpins intangible asset value is lacking acutely in South Africa. JC top 50 listed companies, thanks to some research that Yanda did this week. Um, the mention of innovation in tangible design on company reports, annual financial statements, 2018, 51 times those, those phrases appear in those financial reports. Not unsurprising if you look at the King Four slide. But the words intellectual property, trademark, patent, or copyright are used only four times on average, four times on average by, for those companies, and 15 of them, a number of them in this room, do not use them at all. So again, my conversation here is that we're not, we're un, we, we don't know how to use intellectual property to create value within companies, and there's a lack of investment in intellectual property. So how do we address what we call the IP information gap? This is a worldwide phenomenon, by the way, but it's particularly acute in South Africa. We need to educate. People need to understand. I'm speaking to largely a room of a converted, but most people don't understand the difference between a trademark and a copyright and a patent. We need to make IP accessible, and I put the firms in here. We really need to get off, out of our offices into areas to go and talk about IP. We need to get rid of our suits, talk about it like it's everyday language. And we really need to invest in the SME sector, because if we don't, I'm afraid our own market's going to shrink. Proper IP governance, and we've been working on a number of things, but how do you have proper IP governance in your firm? If you're an entrepreneur and you don't have the time to do this, how do you do this? And I think there's a role to be played. Well, there definitely is a role to be played in making sure that you, you start off with a bicycle and end with a Rolls Royce in terms of IP governance. It's made easy. Accurate IP disclosures to gain trust, value, and opportunity. I just want to talk about this for a second. Although IP doesn't sit on the balance sheet and is not often used in the conversation around funding, it's not to say that it shouldn't be there at all. There should be disclosures on balance sheet, on financial statements about where IP is in its life cycle, yeah. potentially about the gaps, potentially about what you're trying to achieve, and what amount of time you've spent in generating that internal IP. And the reason for this is twofold, is that it creates trust with your stakeholder. A lot of these things, I'm sure, are off, you make a judgment by feel. Is this person really interested in this business, where they're going or her, and, and how are they using their IP? And having an understanding, even an understanding of where their gaps will in, in, engender trust. Uh, which, once you've got trust, then you're likely to get the value, then you're likely to get the opportunities. And then stakeholder activism. What I mean by that is effectively what's happening with uh, Theranos and locally as well, where people get pissed off if, are, if they are misled and they are dodgy. Um, so just in finishing quickly, growth on the right-hand side drives needs investment, and investment needs value, value needs intellectual property. There's an IP information gap, which is leading to missed opportunities, which are leading to, to, to reduce growth. It's particularly acute in South Africa, um, it's a challenge across all sizes of business, both SMEs and, and large businesses, and, but I would say that the SMEs are most vulnerable. Just to give you an example, not for you to sleep on it, but perhaps just to ponder. In, 19, in 1870, Mr. Simmons opened his first factory in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He started out by manufacturing wooden telegraph insulators and cheese boxes. He branched into making bread strings of bed springs after receiving a patent for a woven bed spring in payment of a debt. This happened in 1870. By 1890, it was the largest of its kind in the world. And I think this is what can be done. 
with the proper use of intellectual property. So that's where I'd like to just leave it. Thanks, Darren. That was very interesting. So we're going to take a few questions um, that I, I did see pop up there. But just to summarise from, you know, from everybody's perspective, I think funding, it isn't easy out there. It is a tough economy. And some of the tips and advice that you've got from the panel have been really useful, and I've certainly picked up some, some tips. Um, so I'm just going to just summarise for us. Uh, first of all, dodgy. <laughs> It's come up a few times. A good character, a good track record as an individual will help. And I think going into the story of what Darren's talking about, that that moves into the business and the reputation of the business. And an I, your IP or your brand will obviously enhance the reputation that is there behind you and your business. Number two, have good information um, and present that information properly to, to funders. You normally have one shot at it. So if you get it wrong, they're going to judge you in a way that may not give you a second chance. So people like ourselves, um, like other professionals, can help you package that information properly. Um, and then obviously you need to have a viable business and a viable business proposition that can pay for the funding. And somehow you need to prove that through cash flows or other mechanisms if you don't have the collateral behind your business uh, to, to stand behind that. So just some of the summaries of, of what we've discussed. And, and these are only a few of the mechanisms out there. I think we've just chosen some of our, our partners and providers of funds um, on, on the Funding Hub portal. I think there's a lot more fun, funding providers out there that can offer different kinds of funding. So please, please go and have a look at those to get some more information. Right, I'm just going to take these few questions. I think we have still got a few minutes, about 10 minutes. So open to the panel. The first question is, how do we reach entrepreneurs, especially in the poorer areas of South Africa, that do not have access to companies like ours? Is, is, can someone help with that? I'll give it a stab. Um, so look, I, I have to acknowledge that there is a skew um, in terms of access to, to business financing. I think one of the very first questions we ask is, do you have a, re a revenue of a million rand or more for, for the past 12 months? And, you know, that in itself creates a distortion in terms of the access. Um, but we are currently working with one of the kind of largest distribution programs in South Africa. Um, essentially, it's a product available in every Spaza shop, and then that should also give access to, to people seeking finance in these types of areas. And I think the next step to that is trying to find financiers that are willing to look at businesses that are smaller, um, take a little bit more risk on it, but to acknowledge that you know sometimes, times the next. I, my personal belief is that the next large innovation in South Africa is not going to be born out of discovery. It's going to be born out of someone that's um, kind of inventing something for for a need and a desire, rather than something that someone that's inventing just to be the next big thing. Question for Darren: How is value assigned to IP, and how would I value my trademark or copyright. Are the valuations done by third-party valuers? And they are. Um, rather than answer this myself, and it's not a cop-out, we've got here monetizing emerging technologies, patent myth valuation methodologies in the first breakout session by Vainan Furia. I'd really like to put, to put, you, put you there. If he's just going to focus on... on, on, on and, uh, by the way, those met methodologies go across all forms of IP. So um, uh, let me leave that and... And, and let the panel answer the other questions if you don't mind. Okay. So another question is, sounds like there's a skills gap between the birth of an idea and the funding stage. How can that be bridged, re-putting the plans into place and then s successfully getting the funding, I suppose, timeously? That's the question. I'll take that one. That's, that's one that I find very interesting. And, and um, I did a, a bit of work in the renewable energies uh, uh, field. And you find there that the, the guy that's got to develop the concept might spend five or ten million rand to develop that concept and to get offtake agreements signed with people who want power and to, uh, to come up with the technology. And then once they've spent that five to ten million rand, people are willing to lend them 100, 200 million rand. But nobody wants to invest in that five to ten in the front end. And that's where the difficult part is. So that, that answers that question. But 
the, there are myriad of ways of doing it. And it comes back to what I said earlier. First way is only spend your money on what's essential. Everybody starts a business case from, here's the perfect business case, let me have all the funding in place before I start this business case. Don't do that. Just focus on the absolute key things so that you uh, cut down your, your, your funding requirements. Uh, there's also the EDSD spend out there. There's crowdfunding, angel, angel funders, although it's not easy to access. And then it's having people like us to hold your hand, to guide you there through that process. And, and maybe to tell you that there's a bit of further development to go before you can actually try and take it to market. Can I, can I add a bit to that? Yes, sure. Um, I think, yeah, just an important thing for businesses to understand is that funding an idea is extremely difficult. And there's very few funders out there that will do that. Uh, typically speaking, if you're at that ideation stage, it is about starting to develop what the actual business case and business model is. And if you aren't able to actually determine that, accessing funding is pretty, you can almost say it's, it's going to be impossible. Because at the end of the day, anyone that's going to invest, whether it be equity or debt, they're looking, they're looking for a return. And if you can't show that there is going to be a return in that in the future, it, it starts to become very difficult. So when you see most financiers, even government financiers, they're, they're more interested in funding businesses that have a track record. So what a lot of businesses don't realize is start small, as, as Andrew said. You know, sh prove your concept. Do a pilot if it's something you're developing. Uh, sell to a few small customers before you sell to the big customers. Mm -hmm. Show that there is a market for your product, and right away that ch just changes the dynamic um, when finances are, are evaluating the business. Thanks, Zara. Thank you. And then a question for KP. Do you have referral places for those who do not understand the financial lingo so they can better be prepared like, so they can be prepared before they meet you. So there's a few points I can suggest where to go, what to do. The first is Google is your friend, and uh, you'd be amazed what you'd be able to find in there, you know, and without being judged, isn't it? Uh, and so you can ask all those types of questions. So that would be the, the first thing. That, and, and probably in this order is what I'm suggesting. The second is go to your accountant or some accountant that you're about to engage in they will be able to uh, navigate and translate and teach you Greek, right? The, the third is talk to peers, either other fellow entrepreneurs or other entrepreneurs you may know that have got a decent business and you know they would have gotten funding. Now you're sitting with them over a beer or a cup of coffee and you can ask them all the kind of questions. The fourth would be there are people like Funding Hub, Zahra's Business, Andrew, and there are others that, that, uh, uh, that will be able to help you and advise you in that process. And, and lastly, don't be shy to just ask the funder themselves. Some are empathetic, you can reach out and, and say, explain this to me and those types of things. So these are the, those will be the five. Thanks, thanks KP. And then a question for Zara. Um, is there a resource available which sets out different, the different types of grant funding available? Um, I would say that if you want to know what grant funding is available, you can certainly go onto the DTI's website, which has, and if you follow the financial assistance link, um, we'll have all the funds there. Uh, just be wary and, and read what, what it says very clearly. A lot of the funds that are listed there aren't uh, actually currently being administered. They're either put on hold, have been cancelled, whatever the case might be. Um, businesses are also very welcome to visit our website, which goes through different industries, different sectors, and we'll discuss the types of grant funding that, that would be available. Thank you. Darren, um, is it not enough to include IP valuation in goodwill valuation of business? Are you suggesting separate accounting? I am suggesting separate accounting. I don't think it is sufficient to, to put IP valuation as part of your goodwill, lump it up. There's so many other things that go in there as well. But the whole context of our IP evaluation, re regarded by many as a dark art anyway, you need to give context, you need to create trust. That means you need to interpret that IP evaluation through notes on your balance sheet or on your financials. So that people understand what you're thinking of, how you've done it, they can criticize it, you can answer it, and have an open con uh, conversation. So yes, I am. Not necessarily a separate accounting, but certainly se a separate context. Right, and then there's, there's another question for you, which I'll, which I'll move to before the <coughs> final question. How expensive is it to protect your intellectual property? In what ways can one reduce these costs? I think it's surprisingly cheap if you know what you're doing. Um, first of all, if you just go through it, there's only really one form of IP that you have to pay for, and that's patents. 
um, the rest, if you do it properly, actually costs you nothing other than uh, good common sense and, and maybe speaking to a lawyer who's prepared to give you some time and a roadmap. But what I think you'll find is as you go along your, your journey and as you build up your business, you'll want to invest, invest more and obviously there's more spend and more budget. And to be honest, that's what's, that's what the, what's, what's really in it for the IP lawyer. Uh, and if you consider him or her in that way, I think you can, you can achieve that rather cost effectively. Okay, thank you. And then there's a question here, so I'm just going to take, a, uh, I think, a final question before we sum up. How do institutions like the Funding Hub and FD Centre, I presume, make money? Do they charge entrepreneur or do they take a portion of the funding granted? Well, um, I don't know if you want to answer you yours answer first. first. Yeah, I'll answer got first. The mic. So FD Centre does charge. Um, we charge fees for, for what we do and how, how we help people prepare for funding. But as I said, normally you've got one shot at it and it's better to be properly prepared so when you take your documentation in you've got you know you've got everything prepared so we do charge uh, for for the fundraising but hopefully get it right more often than not um, and if you want to oh, it's really nice sitting next to you and I'm able to say that we don't charge um, <laughs> <laughs> we might not hold your hand as far along down the process but our, our platform is free to use um, we do charge the lender for facilitating for facilitating the transaction, so it's free for the entrepreneur and the business. Great, thank you to the audience. Thanks for listening. I hope we've answered some of the questions. There's going to be a, a I think a short tea break afterwards, um, so I'm going to hand back to to the MC where everybody can network and I suppose ask more questions. Thank you for listening.